Hi everyone and welcome to this week's crime and punishment story. Before we begin, can I just say if you enjoy this story, please give it a like or a thumbs up and please do subscribe to the channel if you would like to hear more stories like this one or stories about the history of the North East. Please also feel free to share this video if you think others would enjoy it too. This is a somewhat shocking story of Patrick Forbes who was found guilty of the murder of his wife Elizabeth in 1850 in Newcastle upon Tyne. The crime itself was a very gruesome one to the point where I would rather not describe it in great detail but I hope you will understand why after listening to the story. This is his story. There is virtually no information about Patrick's early life even his age is not completely known. It is estimated at the time of the crime that he is around 40 years old. He was born in Ireland and is a Roman Catholic. One article stated that previous to him leaving Ireland, he had worked as an under-butler for Lord Castle Stewart, but there are no details given as to why he left this employment, but this may well have been simply because of the potato famine, as it would have been around this time that many people left Ireland to go to America and the UK. The only other details I could find about him are a brief description of him being thick-set, round of the face, and that there is nothing very particular about his appearance. He is also described as being somewhat ill-tempered. He had lived in Newcastle for a few years before the crime was committed and was usually employed as a labourer. It is said that he is an intelligent man, able to read and write quite well, but that he is prone to heavy drinking and has been arrested a few times for drunkenness and disorderly conduct since moving to the area. Elizabeth, his wife and also the victim, comes with even less information. There are no details of her early life and her age is only estimated as around 30 years. The details of her marriage to Patrick are also unknown, but of course if they were married in Ireland and moved to Newcastle just a few years before 1850, their details would most likely have been lost, which just basically means that I am not able to find them. Elizabeth is also known to be a heavy drinker. They had at least four known children together, the two older children, a boy of around 15 years of age and a girl of around 16 years of age, were witnesses at the trial. The younger children are mentioned as a girl of around four years of age and a boy of around seven years of age, but all their ages do vary in different newspaper reports. They lived together with their children in a two-roomed tenement in Newcastle in a place known as Clogger's Entry. This is in the area of a place called The Side. They lived on the fourth floor of the building and a Mrs Dees lived on the second floor. She was well known to the family and their oldest daughter often spent time in her home. In the weeks leading up to the murder, Patrick had been out of work but he had just recently got himself a job and he had worked for one week and had received a wage of 10 shillings and sixpence. He had given his wife 9 shillings for housekeeping and he had kept a small amount back which he had planned to use to buy some leather to repair the children's shoes. Elizabeth had gone out on the morning of the murder with the intention of buying food, but instead she ended up in one of the local public houses with another neighbour by the name of Mrs Wheatley. Mrs Dees had called on Patrick in the afternoon and told him that he was wanted at one of the public houses. He had firstly said that he would not go, but then he changed his mind. Here he found his wife spending his wages on alcohol. For whatever reason, he then also decided to stop at the pub and began drinking rum. Elizabeth left before him and had it back, headed back to their home. There are some reports which state that they left together, but most say that she had left first. When he arrived home a short while later, it is said that he found his wife passed out on the passage stairs. His daughter claimed that he actually tripped over her. He went for his neighbours, Mrs Dees and Mrs Wheatley, and asked them, to help him carry her inside, which they did, and he then placed her onto their bed. It was said that while carrying Elizabeth up the stairs, she had hit her head against the door frame, but the neighbours did not feel that she'd been harmed by this, and Patrick certainly hadn't been bothered by it, 
but of course he wasn't exactly sober, so might not have really noticed. Mrs Dees and Mrs Wheatley both left, leaving the couple to sleep off their drinking session. The following are witness reports about the few hours leading up to the murder. The older daughter and the younger children were with Mrs Dees in her home, and the older daughter claimed that she had gone into her parents' room twice to get bread for the younger children. At no time did she note as anything was wrong. She thought they were both just asleep. She did say she had noticed a wet patch near the bed at one point, but just assumed that her father had been sick. The room was only lit by the firelight, so it would have been quite hard to notice if the wet patch, pet, if the wet patch had been blood or something else. Mrs Dees said she had gone upstairs with the oldest daughter once, but she said she was unable to see into the room from where she was standing on the outer stairs, but she did not hear any arguments, so she also assumed the couple were still asleep. Patrick and Elizabeth's son had returned home from work to get his tea, but on entering the door and seeing his parents both laying on the bed in what he thought was a drunken state, he decided not to stay and he left again immediately, not returning until much later that night. When he returned the second time, it was around 10pm, and then he went into the room and sat down beside the fire, where he said he was dozing on and off. He did not notice anything wrong, and again assumed his parents were both still asleep. He said his father had woken at one point and told him to go to bed in the other room, which he had done. Sometime after 1am, the son claimed to hear his father shouting, Wake up, Betty! and then he shouted for him to run down for Mrs Dees and told him his mother was dead. Mrs Dees said it was the daughter who came to work, wake her, telling her that they were needed upstairs as her brother had told her that their mother was dead. They had all headed up to the rooms on the fourth floor and as soon as she saw her mother, it is said that the daughter had cried out loudly, Murder! He's murdered my mother! And police! It was stated in reports at the time that a passing policeman had heard her shouting and had rushed inside to see what was happening. It was quickly realised that Elizabeth was dead. There was said to be a great deal of blood on the floor near the bed and also around the lower part of her body and that she appeared lifeless. The doctor was sent for and after examining the body he said it was his opinion that she had been murdered in the most horrific way. Patrick was then taken to Westgate Police Station where he was arrested on suspicion of the murder of Elizabeth. The inquest was later held at the Bluebell Public House close to where the crime had been committed. The coroner was Mr Stoker, this may be Stoker, and Dr Rain also gave evidence. The crime was truly shocking. It was stated that Elizabeth had died from horrendous internal wounds. They were a little unsure of what had been used to cause the wounds, but they felt it was most likely a poker. However, they also felt that some of the wounds could have been caused by a knife, and Patrick had knives in his possession when he was arrested. They said the weapon or weapons had been pushed inside her body, and if she had been awake at the time, they would have expected to, to have screamed greatly, but it seemed she made little or no sound as she was in a deep alcoholic slumber. They said the wounds were enough to cause her to bleed to death. This method of murder was something none of them had seen before. They were quite aghast at how she had been killed. It was said she had little or no other wounds other than a small mark on her head and a small cut on one of her legs. They felt that the only person who could have committed this crime was her husband, Patrick. Several other witnesses gave evidence, including Mrs Dees and Mrs Whitley, who both told of what they had seen that night, which I have already mentioned. Patrick, it seems, had no memory of the fateful night at all, and could not remember inflicting the injuries on his wife. Although he said that he loved her and that he had no intentions of hurting her, there was much talk of Patrick and Elizabeth fighting on numerous occasions, and that Patrick had often been known to hit her especially when they had both been drinking. One witness said Elizabeth was afraid of Patrick and that she often came to his house to hide from him. He also claimed that he had previously heard Patrick threaten to do for her. 
The jury at the inquest quickly found him guilty of willful murder and Patrick was committed for trial and was taken to Newcastle Prison. The trial took place in late July of 1850 before Mr Justice Whiteman. Patrick had always said he was innocent and he still said this now and pleaded not guilty. He was described as being pale and weak and seemed to have a great difficulty standing. It was also mentioned that he was 46 years old, which is a little older than the first estimate of around 40. During the trial, it was stated that Patrick was indeed a violent man, having once attacked his own daughter so badly that the girl now walked with a limp. However, his daughter and the other children all seemed to care for him very much and all appeared distressed throughout the trial. The defence had attempted to have the charge reduced to manslaughter, as they said had it had not been premeditated, and also as he had been very drunk at the time the murder was committed, he could not have known what he was doing. However, this was not accepted. There was no further information at the trial that is different to what I have already said from the inquest. His two oldest children and neighbours all gave evidence again similar to what they had given previously. The jury retired for around 25 minutes, some reports say less and some say more, before returning with a verdict of guilty of willful murder. The judge then passed a sentence of death by hanging on Patrick Forbes and that his remains would be buried within the grounds of Newcastle Prison. Patrick then cried out, lift up my hands to heaven, and sank back down into his seat. He had to be carried out of the dock by the prison warders. On leaving, it is said he was seen by his children, who all rushed to his side. It was very distressing for all those who were present. The children were crying, and it was difficult to remove them from his side to be able to take Patrick back to the prison. After the trial, it was said that several of those who had been present then left the court to go to Clogger's entry to view where the crime had been committed, like some kind of strange sightseeing tour. When in prison, awaiting his fate, it was said that Patrick was quiet but also restless. He wrote a note stating that he loved his wife dearly and that he was very drunk on that night and could not remember committing the crime, but he did not think anyone else could have done it. He felt he had had a fair trial and was prepared to take the punishment he had been given. The night before his execution, his children had visited him. This again was said to have been another distressing scene. They arrived a little after 6pm and it was said that they stayed almost until 10pm. Patrick had also been visited daily by the Roman Catholic priest and it was said that Patrick had not eaten meat since the Sunday before the execution almost around a week, which was said to be in penance for the crime he had committed. He had barely slept the night before the execution and he had sobbed and moaned almost all night. It was even said that his cries and moans could be heard above the work to build the scaffold which was taking place outside. The execution date was August the 24th, 1850. Although this would be the first to take place at the prison and not in public on the town moor, as had previously been the case, this would still be in public, outside of the prison walls. Crowds were expected to attend, and although some newspapers tried to discourage people going, it was estimated upwards of around 15,000 people were there to watch the Surrey site. It was also market day, and this greatly increased the number of people outside the prison. It is also said that one public house even charged people to sit inside at what they called the best seats to be able to watch in comfort. It seems these crowds caused a great disturbance at times, shouting and laughing as if they were attending some kind of party. Extra police, extra police had to be called in and barricades had to be put in place near to the scaffold to stop people getting too close. It was said that public hangings in no way discouraged people from committing crimes. In fact, they were treated as some kind of day out. This is something I simply cannot understand why anybody would want to go and watch a public hanging. Shortly before 8am on the day of the execution, the hangman, a man named Howard, arrived at the room where Patrick had been taken to from his cell and pinioned Patrick's arms, which means they were tied at the wrists, 
and he was taken from here to the outside of the prison where the scaffold had been erected. It was stated in several reports that a hole had been made in the wall surrounding the prison to give access to the outside to make it a shorter walk for all involved. Patrick was said to be walking with great difficulty and virtually had to be dragged by the prison warders. The prison chaplain told Patrick to walk onto the drop like a man. However, he was unable to do this and had to be placed there by the warders. After being positioned on the drop, the command was given and the bolt was removed and Patrick fell. However, he did not fall correctly and seemed to go to one side and not downwards. There were cries from the crowds to pull him up. This was quickly done and he then fell again. This time it is said his death was instant. After the body had been left for the required time of one hour, it was removed and he was buried in the prison grounds close to the body of Mark Sherwood who had been hanged in 1844. Patrick Forbes had paid the ultimate price for living a life, it seems, surrounded by drunkenness and ill temper. His wife had paid the same price but his poor children were left without a father or a mother. It is not known what happened to them after this time. I'm sure many of you have heard me mention the felon's plot in All Saints Cemetery, as this is where those who had been buried within Newcastle Prison were reburied when the prison was demolished in 1925. Around four bodies were not found, and Patrick Forbes was one of those four. It was stated that at a depth of 11 feet, no trace of either body or coffin was found. It is not known what happened to his body. However, I read an article about an exhibition which had taken place a few years ago about Newcastle Prison, and the article stated that an exhibit of the alleged skin of a man executed in 1850 would be on display. There is no doubt that this man would have been Patrick Forbes, you do have to wonder how they would have some of his skin, if he indeed had been buried, as there would be no reason that I can see to remove any of his skin to keep. Was he secretly donated to medical science, and this is why there was no body to be found in his grave, but that the skin had been kept? Because, after all, I'm sure no one would have expected the prison to be demolished and the bodies to be dug back up and moved, so no one would know if some were not there. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments. I hope you have enjoyed this story, although somewhat sad and tragic, especially for the children left behind, and I hope you understand why I did not go into great detail as to the way the murder was committed. If you have enjoyed this story, please do give it a thumbs up, and please do subscribe to the channel if you'd like to hear more stories like this one. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you again very soon.